enjoy the show. So thanks so much for being a part of it. From Matt Welch and Camille Foster, I'm Kennedy. Good night. Cops firing tear gas into the crowd of protesters. More shootings, more violence. It's been more than a week now that the conflict continues because of outside agitators. Michael Brown gonna change this town. Or is it racism? They didn't even want us to come in there. Us. Blacks. Or is the problem that cops now look like soldiers? Police in military gear and weaponry firing tear gas. But when police face people who throw rocks or bottles or burning gasoline, what are they supposed to do? Whatever they need, whatever this town needs to defend from these protests. The riot police. How do we keep the peace? That's our show tonight. John Stossel. What happened this month in Ferguson is awful. More than a week of sometimes violent protests, several people shot, several hundred arrested. It's all terrible. But do you remember the Cincinnati riots in 2001? 800 people were arrested. The Los Angeles riots after the Rodney King beating, 16,000 arrested, 58 people killed. In Seattle, 40,000 people protested world trade. Some destroyed stores. 600 people were arrested. There's been lots of urban conflict in America, worse than what's happening in Ferguson. It was the Watts riot in Los Angeles that gave America the highly militarized SWAT teams. More than 100 square blocks were decimated by fire and looters. It began after a violent confrontation between white police officers and a black family that led to six days of violence that took 34 lives. At the time, politicians said this riot happened because police lost control. They didn't have the equipment, so they got it. On this program, we discuss how government always grows, and I've been reporting on how the use of SWAT teams has grown, not just in big cities, even in small towns like Ferguson. One specialist who trains SWAT teams is Major Steve Iams. And you've been in Ferguson this past week. Four different days, yes, sir. Maybe some people there you had trained? There are some people there that I have trained, yes, sir. So what about this argument? It's you guys are part of the problem. You're overusing this SWAT equipment and technique. I think in the immediate case, there's some confusion between what is SWAT equipment and what is public order equipment. Uh, I've not been there 24-7. I mentioned I've been there four different days. The vast majority of what you're seeing uh, as it relates to public order, the tear gas, the shields, that sort of thing, is actually not uh, normally equated in the manner it's being used to a SWAT team. Uh, the, the unique circumstance here is that, contrary to what some may believe, the issue of public disorder in the U.S. and uh, the efforts police put towards it is actually statistically very, very rare. Uh, most police officers in America will never stand a skirmish line, as you're seeing in Ferguson. And, and, the, and this riot is smaller than most Americans realize. Uh, both in geographic and, and in people. I would say the affected area is about eight blocks long of a four-lane road that during the day there's almost no one there. And then a group comes out in the evening that in size would be uh, very small compared to many others. Yes, so sir. didn't the police overreact? I mean, bringing all this equipment, doesn't that invite someone to get mad and saying, why are you treating me this way? Well, I certainly can't put myself into the mind of someone who might have that belief, but the practical reality is when you have uh, disorder to the degree of buildings being burned, people being shot, and I think a key part of this that plays into the issue of how officers react and what the agencies do to respond has been this uh, sporadic gunplay, unpredictable, uh, largely unseen, and I simply can't apologize for officers who are facing uh, a legitimate effort to try to allow people to protest, but likewise have the concern that bullets could be and have been flying at any moment. They're always going to err on the side of appropriate equipment and uh, response capability for someone who might be shooting at so, them. So what do you teach in a situation like this? I mean, you have these words like skirmish line and spike and wedge. Uh, the whole concept of public disorder management or crowd control is uh, preceded by what the actual event is itself from the minds of those who were there. What the people are doing there directly affects what the police uh, should do and will do. If you have uh, peaceful protesters or even just upset people, but people who are not breaking the law, 
Uh, it's my opinion and belief that we have an absolute obligation to provide them a forum to do that. The problem comes when personal property is uh, either damaged or destroyed or people are getting assaulted and hurt and right. then trying so what to separate. What are the separate. police supposed to do? I mean, it's stuff being thrown at you? It mm -hmm. makes sense to have a shield. Well, it, it, it makes sense to have a shield if you're going to stand there and allow the rock throwers to continue to throw rocks. Uh, it's more of a strategic process. If you decide to let the rock throwers hold the line, then you need to have a shield. If you want to deter the rock throwers and make them stop doing that, there are various ways. Tear gas is one, and though tear gas may have a, a negative connotation and appearance, the one unique value to tear gas is it allows the cops to move people without having to go face to face, which almost always ends up with a citizen getting hit with a police baton. Fire hoses have been used. Not in this case. No, but okay. in many demonstrations. Not since the 60s that I'm aware of. That was considered abusive. I'm confident that the reason fire hose water cannon is a more accurate term now in, in uh, public order worldwide, the reason that's uh, almost never used in American policing is because of the things that law enforcement did do to abuse citizens and it has such a uh, connection to that abusive period of the 60s that the vast majority of fire services in America have policy that says they will never turn fire hoses on people unless they're burning. Uh, when I first met Steve, I was preparing uh, that report on the increased use of SWAT teams. Columbia Police Search Warrant! Columbia Police Search Warrant! Every day, SWAT teams crash into homes at dawn with their guns drawn, often with lots of military equipment that seems unnecessary and provocative to me. Nobody paid much attention to how heavily armed they were until the Ferguson riots. Now, suddenly, this is a big story. Now, I think of Fox as a law and order kind of place, but now here I, I hear all kinds of skepticism about heavy police response. This just doesn't seem to be well organized or well thought out. Rushing one protester, surrounding him with a dozen rifles and a crowd of civilians, this is a recipe for, for bad news. Police and military gear and weaponry firing tear gas at protesters and harassing and arresting members of the media. Just one example of the increasing militarization of police all over the country. Increasing in militarization. Pushed by people like you? I don't think that would be accurate to say I push that. I'm a very strong advocate of properly training and equipping police officers. And from a factual perspective, the uh, only thing I'm seeing out there literally at the scene that is comparable to a, a military weapon would be the rifle itself. Uh, the vehicles in particular uh, are basically moving cover. And if you are in a scenario where gunfire is occurring, I'm just at a loss as to how I could logically argue with someone that police officers should be put out in an environment where bullets are flying around and not take advantage of bullet resistant protection. It, I just don't know how to make that argument. Well, thank you, Steve. Since he defends most of what SWAT teams do, let's hear from someone who disagrees, who says they're taking our freedom. And more people do say that today. Lots of people claim America's police now go too far. It's becoming more and more like a police state. We are entering a police state, and people are very right to insinuate that militarizing the police is not the right idea here. This is a big brother police state that's bad. The author of a book called Police State USA says America is on the cusp of being a police state. That's Cheryl Chumley. Really, come on, that's <laughs> over the top. We are pretty free in America. We are pretty free in America uh, when you compare us to other nations around the world, but we're not pretty fee free in America when you compare us to past generations. Uh, if you look at the state of what's going on in America right now, and you know, in my book I chronicle easily a hundred different cases where government has overreached and encroached on constitutional liberties of, of, of Americans. Uh, we're at the point now in America, a little girl can't run a lemonade stand in her driveway without having the local zoning zealot come in and fine her $50. We're at the point now where elementary school kids down in Georgia have their irises scanned as they board the bus, all in the name of safety. We're at the point now where nebulous uh, environmental laws prevent homeowners from building a shed in their own backyard because there might be a floodplain issue in a hundred years. This is the America where we're at and I really implore people to read my book and tell me how we're not in a police state because my research shows that we're right on the cusp. 
Because they always pass more laws, and then there's more stuff for the police to enforce. It's not just the police. If you look at Ferguson and what, what's gone on there, you can certainly point to example after example where a case can be made where police have gone above and beyond what they're constitutionally tasked to do. But I look at Ferguson, and I look uh, broader what's going on with police around the nation. We just had that poor Atlanta toddler uh, half blown up, spent five weeks in a medically induced coma because police executed a no-knock uh, search warrant on a drug suspect's home through the flashbang grenade landed in a crib. You know, when, when instances like this happen, we shouldn't be discussing them in a, a, a news studio. We should be on the streets then protesting. We should be going to our local boards of supervisors and saying, we don't want our police to have this equipment, or if they have it, we need strict guidelines. Previous guess is we have to have it to, for our safety if bullets are flying. See, you can cite safety and make a case to to do anything. If you really want police to be safe, how about flying an airplane overhead and dropping bombs? You know, that's just ridiculous. But the point is, when certain things happen, when innocent Americans die, as I profile in my book, you know, a Marine out in Arizona dying when police busted in his home, when things like that happen, that's time to take action. And I think most police don't want that happening either. He died because somebody was busting in his home. He pulled out a, his weapon and they shot him. Yes. Um, he, here's what one of America's noisiest political opportunists said about so much military equipment being given to police. If you got enough money to bring all that equipment in here, you got money for jobs for these young people. More handouts is the answer. Right, more government money, more more entitlement spending and so forth. You know, you have Ferguson and the issues that are taking place there, and then you have the economy and job growth. And those two things are different. And they shouldn't be for the reverend's good, uh, you know, name. They shouldn't be joined together. Now, in Israel, where they deal with uh, rioting by Palestinian young people who often throw stones, uh, the IDF often shoots the person throwing the stone. They've killed 46 people since 2005. So we could say America's police are restrained. Well, come on, Israel. <laughs> Israel's in an enclave where every nation that lives around Israel doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist. They want to completely wipe Israelis off the face of uh, the map. I don't think our local police want to wipe protesters off the face of America. So there is a big difference there. And now in Ferguson, a new level of authority has been called in. The governor declaring a state of emergency, calling in the National Guard. And the National Guard will be able to help restore some peace and order in this community. I mean, as if the National Guard is magic, though in this case they seem to have helped and they, are, they have left now, um, or are leaving now, but what can they do the police that the police can't do? Right, and what's funny, if you look at the video of National Guard and police, it's really difficult to tell the difference between who's who. Who's the soldier tasked with uh, serving and protecting for America's security? Who's the civilian police officer paid by taxpayers to protect, first and foremost, the citizen? Uh, you know, and that in itself speaks volumes when you can't tell the difference between the soldier versus the police officer on the scene. We have a problem. Thank you, Carol Chumley. Uh, to join this argument, you can tweet using that hashtag Ferguson or post on my web, my Facebook page. We want to know what you think. And coming up, despite the presence of all that military gear in Ferguson, police sometimes did not stop looters. This store owner is upset that his store was trashed. There's no police. There ain't no police. So now some store owners are defending their stores with their own guns. Is that a good thing? We'll debate that next. We trusted the cops to take care of the situation. That's what they said. They're going to keep it peaceful. They didn't do their job. There was a shop owner in Ferguson. His store was looted. He saw it happening on television. So he then called the police but got the runaround. He's trying to tell me that they got cops in front of the store and they got it under control. I told him, no, sir. There's, I'm watching the news right now. You guys are all the way down the street while they running out this, the store with the boxes. 
The cops would not come. And the mayor of Ferguson later said the police had been ordered not to, to keep them safe. Is it true that the reason a lot of the police were, stand, the police were standing down over some of these weekend protests because they were told uh, by the man in command not to interfere, to let the looters do what they were, looters are going to do? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm told. What was given was a command not to put the officers in danger. So many shop owners and other people are now arming themselves. Steve King owns a gun store in St. Louis, just a few miles away from Ferguson. Steve, gun sales are sharply up? Yes, they are. 400%, he told us? Yeah, one day last week it was 400%. Overall, this week, uh, compared to this week last year, we're up um, a little over 75%. Now, if you view this as a good thing, but what, what if there's all this protest, what if people are buying weapons to shoot police officers? Well, there's a big mis misconception here on how people are buying firearms. The majority of the firearm purchasers are law-abiding citizens that go through a very strenuous background check. And, uh, you know, we're talking about five to $800 firearms here. So majority of the people don't go through a background check, a criminal background check, and buy an expensive gun to go out and commit a crime. So I don't think this is a, I would tell you 100% of the people that have bought guns in the last 10 days have bought them for defensive purposes. And Missouri's laws are sort of average for America. No, no state restri restrictions on buying a gun at a gun store as long as you pass the background check and you're 18 years old. If you want to get a concealed carry permit, you have to have eight hours of gun training. Um, but that frightens a lot of people. Look at some of these quotes from a conservative commentator here, David Frum. Does anybody think things would be better in Ferguson if the demonstrators were armed? Well, John, I think that we're looking at it a little bit differently here. I don't think that we're talking about demonstrating or having the demonstrators armed uh, while they're demonstrating. I think we're talking about people that are defending themselves against the rioters and the looters. These are homeowners and residents of Ferguson who, quite frankly, feel like they're being trapped in their house with no protection at all. And the Department of Justice does say that guns are used in self-defense between 100,000 and 2 million times. It's a big range because I guess they don't know. It's not always reported. Having the gun doesn't necessarily mean using it. It may just be showing it. Well, we never advocate that you pull a gun out just to brandish it. Uh, we advocate that you use a firearm as a last resort, and you're only using that firearm to defend yourself or your loved one against serious bodily harm or death. So people aren't just going out flashing firearms around uh, trying to stop crime or to stop you know, anything from happening out there. That's not what this is all about. But you talked to one store owner who, who found looters in his store and had a gun and simply said, I don't want to shoot you, get out, and they did. Absolutely, because again, taking a human life is the last resort, and you only do so if you feel that your life is in jeopardy or the life of a loved one. Thank you, Steve King. As the debate about guns continues, here's some statistics. More than 100 million Americans now own guns. That's more than ever. 11 million now have permits to carry concealed weapons. That's up from less than half that seven years ago. So since 2007, we have a big increase in the number of people who arm themselves. During that same period, murder and violent crime dropped by 22%. Something to think about. Coming up. I think the best defense against bad policing is a simple camera. This, my own phone, can record what really happened and also just having it out here encourages people to behave as if mom's watching. But sometimes when people record police officers, they get angry and arrest the person with the camera. I'm not shutting it off. Officer, well, you're going to jail. Excuse me? So What did happen in Ferguson? Did Michael Brown threaten or attack Officer Wilson? 
Or did the officer maliciously kill an unarmed teenager? We'll probably never really know. Eyewitness testimony is always imperfect. The medical evidence gives clues, but nothing definitive. If only Officer Wilson had worn a camera, or if a bystander had filmed the shooting, then we'd know what happened, and the rioting in Ferguson might never have started. A camera can make a big difference, but many police officers don't like them. So go go away go. now! Phil Dats tried to film a police pursuit. All right, you're going away. Put it down. Put it down. Put it down. You're under arrest. Dats is one of many people who've been arrested for videotaping the police. And that's just wrong. We have the right to take pictures in America, and that includes filming the police. What first convinced me of the benefits of taping police work was a bicycle protest right near the studio. A police officer said a bicyclist ran into him. But the biker claimed, the police officer knocked me over. Now, I was skeptical, because I ride a bike, and I've seen how aggressive my fellow bikers can get. But then this video turned up and showed that the officer was the aggressor. Despite incriminating evidence like that, more cops now support the use of cameras by police officers. Erin Gorman is a police sergeant in Evesham, New Jersey, where she's been wearing that camera. You want to point to it there? Uh, for a month and a half, she wears it because her new police chief, Chris Chu, insists on it. Chief, why? When I became chief, one of the first things I noticed that we were handling approximately 77,000 incidents per year, calls for service, car stops, domestic violence. We only had the ability to capture 22,000 of them because we had dashboard cameras. And what we did not capture was the ability to uh, our interactions with the public outside of the police car's view. So as one of my major priorities going forward was we owe that to our community, our customers. We should be providing them with the best service and in return, we got to have that level of transparency that we'll have the collaboration that we work together as one. And, and as it turns out, protection for your, yourselves too. You sent us this example that you say shows why police need cameras. What happened? Stay. Hello. What's wrong? Huh? What happened to you? The video shows one of your officers approaching a man with a bloody face. The man's confused, combative. Stop. No, you need to sit down. Your officer eventually tackles him and cuffs him. Sit down now. So this protects police because he, somebody might have accused you of blooding his face. Correct. In the past, we've had them uh, excessive force complaints or, or demeanor complaints where without the ability to video and audio record, it was a he said, she said. So with this is a classic example of we immediately looked at the video and it showed exactly what the officer saw and how he acted, which was in conformance with our policies and procedures. And Aaron, you mind wearing this thing? It's sort of heavy and... Yeah, uh, yeah, it might be the lightest thing that we do wear, so um, I don't mind at all. Uh, Your fellow officers complain? All the feedback that I've gotten from them has been positive. Um, there was that initial hesitance at first for the same reason that I'm sure citizens, um, you know, citizens filming the police, the hesitance that, you know, not the entire event is captured. It's like reading the last page of a book and getting the conclusion but not knowing the sequence of events that led up to it. But At this does capture the entire encounter with the cops. It starts 30 seconds, before, it's always rolling, and then what, you, you press this button twice, and then it's on. Correct. You, you always press it? Yes. They're in trouble um, if they don't press yeah, it, right? right? Absolutely. Our policy within our department has it so that any citizen contact, any encounter that we have with the public is, is recorded. So there's measures that are in place now, if that isn't done, um, it's looked into by the Internal Affairs Investigation to make sure that there's nothing um, that's missing. And is it worth the cost? These cost uh, how much? Four uh, hundred, the, approximately, they're about $400 for each unit, but then there's licensing fees and storage fees. So. Which is more than the $400 somehow. Absolutely. 
Is it worth it? Absolutely. Because you look at the cost of return that we will get, if you look at it across America, there's almost $2 billion worth of lawsuits for sex excessive Accusation accusations. And now they're less likely to make the accusation. Correct. And in one study, the police were less likely to use force when they wear a camera. So thank you, Chris and Aaron. Coming up, so we continue to debate the conflict in Ferguson, we'll cover attacks on libertarians. But next, are white cops racist? Or do we have race riots for another reason? seen the division. You, you go through that town and you're like, oh God, I hope Ferguson police don't stop me. I hope the police don't stop me. Is the mostly white police department in Ferguson racist? Maybe. Maybe that's why there's been rioting. Maybe Michael Brown's death was just the tipping point. Spike Lee says in America there's a war on the black male. Not just killing us. It's educational system. It's the prison system. It's for the young black men growing up with no hope. So I think it's very, I think it's systematic. There is a war on black boys in this country. Yeah. In my opinion, there is a war on African American men. A war? John McWhorter has written several books about race, like Crisis in Black America. Is there a war against black men? No, there isn't. And that notion is theatrical. There's room for theater, but no, there is not a war against black men. However, there is a very serious problem. And what it is, you talk about my books. Fifteen years ago, I wondered why so many of my fellow black people seemed to think that being black was still as much of a burden as it had been in 1960. I genuinely didn't understand. I don't mean that I thought they were crazy. I thought, I don't feel that way. Racism feels to me like stepping in some gum sometimes. And there are these other people who've led lives I thought were similar to mine who seem to feel that nothing's really changed. I very quickly found out, and that's when I started writing these books, the problem is the police. The reason that so many people are given to saying things like there is a war against black men is because of a very real problem, which is the relationship between police forces and particularly young black men. That's what creates the feeling of and us being under siege. you cite three reasons for that. Mm -hmm. The main reason that police end up flooding black communities so often such that you have interactions that lead to incidents like the one that murdered Mike Brown is the war on drugs. Most people don't think of it that way, but the simple fact of the matter is that if there were no war on drugs, the police would not have nearly as much reason to be in these neighborhoods and, and this is the part that's harder to talk about, but like most such things is true, if you are a young black man growing up in a community like that, where the schools are bad, where all sorts of things are bad. It's not exactly the hardest thing to drift the wrong way. Now, one wrong way that you can drift is to sell drugs for a markup because they're illegal. You don't have to be an evil person to do that, and not everybody does it. But Big if you could, are tempting when if you're you, young. Yeah, and if you couldn't do that because drugs were legal, then you wouldn't have so many black men drifting into that in the first place, and therefore we would have a new racial situation in America. And that's not rhetoric. I think it is simple, solid truth. The war on drugs is what makes thugs. And the war on drugs is what brings cops into these neighborhoods to kill people in the first place. And the equipment the SWAT teams have, which was meant for riots, now is mostly being used for drug raids. Yeah. And if we didn't have a war on drugs, we wouldn't have to talk about the ethicality of it. It simply wouldn't be needed. It would solve so many problems. But your second reason, racism. There is some racism. Oh, Certainly. Racism is part of America. It's part of humanity. It's part of the black American past. It's part of the black American present. It's part of the black American future. And in particular, if you're talking about a situation where a white cop and a young black man are in some sort of clinch of a situation, then certainly the racist sense that a black boy or man is more likely to be violent is going to come into play. That is not fair, but it's also true. But of course, the or it's not fair, but it's true? 
But frankly, a lot of things that aren't fair are true. Now, what's important is that the reason that white cops feel this way is not because of how white people felt about slaves 200 years ago. There is a direct cause, which is that we have to face that black men do create a disproportionate amount of the homicides in this country. We can talk about what all the reasons for that are. Those reasons tie into racism, but that's still true. The stereotype comes from something real, so but it doesn't end up getting people a killed. To be suspicious. Unfortunately, many police do have a reason to be suspicious. That doesn't mean that they should be killing people, however. But you know, John, I lack a certain amount of faith. I don't know how training can really address this sort of thing. I think we've kind of hit a wall on Ferguson, which is really the same thing as we went through with Sanford, Florida last year. Really, we've got to make it so that these boys don't encounter these cops nearly as often so that the racism won't end up playing its part in a clinch. I don't think we can exterminate the racism with editorials. What we can do is get the cops out of the communities. By ending the war on drugs. I mean, I would also add, when you talk about race and people's reactions, is it just skin color? I look at these pictures and I see these two kids wearing hoodies and their pants low. If these were white kids, mm -hmm. I'd be apprehensive mm -hmm. looking at them. And I look at the, I, I see the kids leaving Catholic high schools in New York City. I help some pay tuition. Nobody's afraid of these kids if they have on a crisp white shirt. Yeah. And if they don't swagger when they, or whatever the word is. Yeah, the, the, the move, yeah. All of that is not ideal. What it is, is a grand middle finger stuck up to authority. And in particular, when you're talking about the pants hanging low, the genealogy is pants in prison where you're not allowed to wear a belt. That is a kind of a gesture of solidarity to black boys and black men well, in prison. Well, many of these kids don't know that. It's just the fashion. Now, it started as that. Now, it's just a matter of what's in the water. It's like the way you pronounce things. It's the way that you happen to walk. You don't think about it. It's part of the culture. And I can guarantee you that dressing in a way that's designed to say F you to the world or to the man or to the cops is something that would ease away if we had one generation of black boys not growing up thinking of the cops as the enemy. Thank you, John McWhorter. Next, how's the media doing? Have we covered Ferguson properly? And what did this Washington Post reporter do to make this cop so mad? Stop videotaping. Let's grab our stuff and go. Let's go. You can move. Let's go. Move. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move, Let's move this way. Hands up, don't shoot. Hands up, don't shoot. Watching the protests in Ferguson, some people have said there's more media here than protesters. Hundreds of journalists have come to Ferguson. One was Reason TV's Paul Dietrich. So you've covered other protests. This one was different. I think this one was different only because it, I think the Ferguson Police Department was not ready for this magnitude of a protest. They were, they were not ready for the amount of people and how angry they would be. Few small town police departments would be. Yeah, exactly. I'm from Los Angeles. We've had a ton of protests over the, over the, over the years, but it, at least in the last 20 years, uh, we've had the Rodney King riots, and everybody remembers the Rodney King riots just because it was so prevalent and it was in the news every day. And the LAPD has taken precautions over the years to make sure that they know how to handle a riot. And they know how to put police officers on the ground in plain clothes, how to surround an area, how to uh, push protesters in the way that they should go. And you sensed sort of a confusion among these police officers as they pushed you around? Uh, <laughs> Well, they didn't push me around. I was there for the two days when everything was quiet. It was right, it was right after they, uh, they, gave security, they gave security over to the highway patrol. Uh, but I sense confusion in the idea that they're, the information that they didn't give out uh, right, after, right after the incident. They didn't name the officer. They didn't name the officer. They, they could have protected him even if they named him. He's That's true. And they didn't give out details about what was going on. And that left a vacuum for everybody else to 
you know, put speculation in, put uh, facts here and there. Uh, it drove a horse race in cable news to find any facts at all, or even just with people tweeting on the internet. And there was a lot of antagonism uh, between reporters and the police. Here's an example of the Ferguson police coming into conflict with reporters. A local McDonald's was a popular hangout for the media because it has free wireless and cheap food, too. At one point, police entered McDonald's and told the reporters, just get out. Stop videotaping. Let's grab our stuff and go. Let's go. You can move. Let's go. Move. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move, Let's move this way. That video was shot by Wesley Lowry, a Washington Post reporter who was arrested after that. And he says he and another reporter, Ryan Riley, were roughed up. Ryan was slammed into a door. I was thrown up into a, a fountain soda machine um, because we weren't leaving a private establishment fast enough and had the audacity to videotape police officers. So let me take the police side here. You, some of you reporters are not barely reporters, a bunch of lefty activists who are probably really obnoxious to police. Uh, who's right? <laughs> well, uh, every, well, people with publishing uh, capabilities, which seems to be everyone these days with cell phone cameras and the ability to publish on the internet, they're all right. They all have First Amendment rights. And it gets into a tough situation uh, when you're trying, to, you're trying to control a protest. I understand that. But going through a McDonald's and getting rid of Huffington Post and Washington Post reporters, that's, it just seems crazy. It, it really comes down to the militarization of police there. The, and there was nothing going on at that McDonald's at the time. It was an attitude. Mm -hmm. It's the mentality officers bring to the streets that they can do anything in the middle of a disaster. And they just go after reporters uh, just clamping down on First Amendment rights. That's a First Amendment right violation. On the other hand, they have a tough job, and a lot of them are scared, and sometimes things are being thrown, and bullets are flying. Th thank you, Paul, of wonderful Reason TV on the web. Coming up, my experience as a fake cop and why police officers are special. We give them powers we don't give to others. Also, finally, my take on who's to blame for what happened in Ferguson. That's next. Several days into the Ferguson protests, I was surprised to see this headline in the Washington Post. Why aren't libertarians talking about Ferguson? Give me a break. Libertarians have warned for years that government is force and that government always grows. And that includes the police. Just last month, I did a Fox News special about the militarization of police. For years, SWAT teams were called out only in emergencies like a riot or bank robbery where hostages were taken. But their use has increased from less than one raid a day to today, maybe a hundred raids every day. And in fact, today police use SWAT teams to raid truck stops that have video poker machines, barber shops, an organic farm, a frat house where there's said to be underage drinking. And Iowa police use this many armed men to raid a house where people are accused of credit card fraud. We libertarians get accused of being paranoid about police power, but we look less paranoid after people watch the heavy-handed police response in Ferguson. Senator Rand Paul wrote a column titled, We Must Demilitarize the Police. Libertarian Representative Justin Amash condemned police for escalating tensions with military equipment. Yet the Washington Post runs that headline? Does the big government-loving media hate libertarians so much they will not acknowledge that we're right about something? Even though it was government police and government-supplied military equipment that escalated the conflict, leftists still found ways to blame libertarians and advocates of private gun ownership. Pulitzer Prize-winning cartoonist Tom Tolles depicted a sarcastic TV viewer watching news from Ferguson and sniping, I'm sure the NRA has an interesting solution for this. As if Ferguson's problems are the fault of people who believe in your right to defend yourself. So, since leftists are so easily confused, let's list who is to blame. First, racism. 
Centuries of white people abusing the civil liberties of blacks have left many blacks resentful of police power. And in recent years, white cops shot on average two young black men every week. But none of that justifies the violence and looting in Ferguson. These are criminals, opportunists, cruelly violating the rights and property of innocent people. But peaceful protesters should not be lumped in with looters. Police must distinguish between protesters and criminals. Police officers are special. We give them, only the police, the legal right to use force on other Americans. That power sometimes changes people. I once ordered a fake police outfit over the internet to illustrate how easy it is to impersonate police officers. Some crooks had done that and then robbed people. Just putting on that uniform changed me. I felt powerful and people on the street treated me with deference. Police officers have told me, yeah, wearing the uniform can change you. Police must use their special power carefully. They do not have the right to execute a suspect unless there's no other way of stopping him and he poses an immediate threat to others. Michael Brown, assuming this is Brown in this store video, robbing and bullying a clerk, may well have been dangerous. He weighed almost 300 pounds. But even dangerous people have a right to be brought to trial, not shot six times. Now this week a source told Fox News that Officer Wilson was beaten, beaten so severely he broke his eye socket. If Brown beat Wilson, that changes everything. But if it's true, why did the police not say that before? Cops sometimes do feel threatened, and they may be threatened, but they still do not have the right to use more force than is necessary. Finally, the Department of Homeland Security and opportunistic politicians deserve some blame for encouraging cops, even those in small towns, to use military equipment. Watching scenes like this, a vet from the 82nd Airborne tweeted, we rolled lighter than that in an actual war zone. When authorities arm cops like soldiers, they may begin to think like soldiers and see the public as their enemy. That makes violent confrontation more likely. That's Stossel for tonight. Another new show at this time next week. See you then.